This is $1,000. If you were like the average idiot, you would probably just take this money and blow it on a watch. But I am so glad you are smarter than the average bear and you're not gonna do that. So, in this video, I am gonna show you the best way to invest $1,000. Most people, when they get $1,000, they blow it just like that on a new TV or a new watch or clothes or whatever thing. But you are smarter than them. You know that if you invest this $1,000, it could eventually change your life. If you invest it in the way that I'm showing you, every single year, that $1,000 could make you $100. And even more than that, the $100 that you make, you're gonna make interest on that the next year. It'll compound and snowball over time. I'm really not exaggerating when I say, $1,000 invested in the right way could change the entire course of your life. It could be the key to you eventually achieving financial freedom. And I'm gonna show you how to invest that $1,000 in this video. I know there's a ton of different YouTube videos on this topic, it's been done to death, but I'm gonna do this in a totally different way. What I'm about to share in this video is gonna be totally unlike anything you've seen in other YouTube videos. I've watched a bunch of them and there's some good advice in there, but I'm gonna show you a unique approach that I think is much better than any of those other videos about how to invest your first thousand. So if you've watched some of those other YouTube videos about how to invest a thousand dollars, you've probably heard this advice pay off your high interest credit card debt or any high interest debt first before investing in anything. Now, if you're mathematically and logically inclined like me, this advice makes a lot of sense, at least on the surface. You might look at your credit card debt and say, oh, so I'm paying 20% per year interest on my credit card debt. Probably the most I could expect to make from my investments is seven or 8%. 20% is more than 7%, so therefore I should pay off my debt first. And I get it, I see why the mathematics of that seem to make sense to you right now. And I'm gonna tell you why it does make sense, but why it doesn't completely make sense if you look at the bigger picture. Now, when you're paying off your debt, it is true that you're unlikely as a beginner investor to earn a 20% guaranteed return like you can get by paying off your high interest debt. But there's another side to this that you're not really considering. When you're investing your first thousand dollars, it's not only about the return that you're gonna make this year. After all, when you're investing your first thousand, the difference between 20% and 10% returns is only gonna be $100. Might seem like a lot right now, but in the long term, it's not gonna make a difference to the big picture of your finances. What's even more important right now is learning. Now, you need to learn how to invest. You have to do this on a small scale for a couple of years before you're gonna feel comfortable and before you're gonna have the skills to put in bigger amounts of money. Now, if you're the type of person that seeks out videos like this instead of watching music videos or videos of cute cats, I know that's because you're more motivated than the average person is. So I know, inevitably, you are gonna have a lot more money than this in the future and probably in the very near future. So it's important that you acquire the skills to invest your money now. And I don't want you to make the same mistake that I did. Now, when I first started making money, when I first started getting motivated to achieve financial freedom, I had a lot of debt when I first started off. Um, I had about $8,000 in credit card debt, I had about $40,000 in student loans, and I owed, I believe it was about $10,000 to the IRS and the Massachusetts Department of Revenue. Um, your financial picture might be a little better, might be a little worse, but I, was, I had a moderate amount of debt compared to most people. So I started off because I didn't know anything about investing, I was listening to videos like this, and what I did is I just paid off my debt first before investing in anything. Then after that, my business started to blow up and I started getting a lot of money. And it got to the point where I wasn't really comfortable with investing, but over the course of about a year, I had about $400,000 in cash in my bank account. Now I know what you're thinking. I would love to have $400,000 in cash in my bank account. And it is a good problem to have in a sense, but it would have been even better if I had the confidence to invest that from the beginning. That $400,000 in cash, if I had invested it back in 2009, it would have been worth about $800,000 today. So I would have another $400,000 if I just had the confidence to invest. 
But I realized though, it's not possible to be confident enough to invest in stocks, to put all your money in the market, and to competently do that so that way you can actually make money if you have no experience. You gotta do this for a few years on a small scale. And here's the good news. Even on a very small scale, you can get a taste of stock market investing. You don't have to put a huge amount of money in. Even if you're just putting $100 in per year, you can get a taste on what type of percentage returns you can expect. And you'll be confident that way. You know if you made a 5% return or a 10% return or a 15% return, if you 10x the money you put in, you 10x your return. And that will tremendously increase your confidence and you'll be able to jump in with both feet once you do have the money. So don't make the mistake that I did and sit in cash for a couple of years while the market passes you by. Start building your skills and your confidence now. Here's the plan that I would recommend to you as an old man with the benefits of hindsight. What I would recommend to you is what I call the 90-10 solution. And what I mean by that is that you are gonna put 90% of your money towards your high interest debt. Mathematically, that does make sense. You'll be putting the bulk of the money towards that. But 10% of the money, $100, is gonna go into investments. And I'm gonna talk about exactly what to invest in in just a minute. This way, you kinda get the best of both worlds. You do get that high guaranteed return that comes from paying off your debt, but you also start investing at a small scale. A year from now, or two years from now, when you come into serious money, then you will have the confidence to jump in with both feet, and you'll have experience on a small scale. That's your first priority. 90% of your first thousand should go towards paying off your debt. What do you do with the money after that? Or what do you do if you're fortunate enough to not have any debt right now? The next investing priority that I want you to put your money into before putting the bulk of your money into stocks and bonds is going to be to put 90% of your money into your own business or 90% of your investable money into things that will improve your income and your productivity even if you don't want to start a business. And here's a few examples of what I mean by this. Let's say that you work from home. Let's say that you're managing online ad campaigns, or let's say that you're a computer programmer, or doing some type of home-based business. Your very next investment, after paying off your high interest debt, in my opinion, should be a great computer setup. Especially if you're doing things that are resource intensive, like graphic design or video editing, a better computer will drastically improve your productivity. Even if you're just doing things like me, like typing in a Word document, a better computer will still improve your productivity by a small amount. And it makes a bigger difference than you think. Let's say you just get 5% more work done, same quality of work, just 5% more because of this better computer. You're not just gonna make 5% more money. In a way that most people don't anticipate, these gains will compound on each other. So I would say getting 5% more work done will probably lead to 50% more money. Here's what I mean by that. Let's say I was working on ad campaigns on an old crappy laptop, as unfortunately I was up until a few years ago. I replaced that with a better computer. It's not crashing, it's faster, my ad campaigns are smoother, and I'm 5% more productive. Just a little bit. Because of that, I'm making my clients a little bit more money. Because I'm making them a little more money, more of my clients are gonna be happy and give me good testimonials. Because I have good testimonials, I will then in turn get more clients. Because I got those new clients, I will in turn get more testimonials. And you can see that same compounding process that usually we think of applying to financial investments also applies to investments in your own business. So it's real important, invest in things like that that improve your productivity. Now again, I want you to keep the 90-10 solution in mind here. 10% of your money is still gonna go into your stock and bond portfolio, so you get practice for when you have so much money, you can't put it all into your own business. And that point's gonna come sooner than you think. But 90% of your money at this stage goes into your business until you can't productively invest anymore. So a work setup is a very obvious way that you can invest that money, but there are other ways that you can invest money productively in your own business too. You can invest money in improving your marketing. One obvious way to do this is to buy marketing books, marketing courses, go to marketing seminars, or to otherwise improve your own skills. You could also hire people to handle aspects of your marketing that you don't personally specialize in. Let's say that you don't specialize in Instagram advertising. You hire someone to manage those campaigns for you. Within a few months, if you find the right person, you might double or triple your investment. Impossible to do that in the stock market. Let's say that you don't specialize in copywriting. 
you hire someone to write a better script for your sales video for you. Again, within a few months, you could double or triple that initial investment. Here's another example of how you can invest money in your own business. Hiring contractors or hiring employees to work for you. Let's say right now you're a one-man show or a one-woman show. You're doing everything in your business yourself. Customer service, you're doing the marketing, you're making the products, everything. Let's say that you hire a virtual assistant for 10 hours a week. Let's say you're paying them $8 an hour, so it's only $80 a week, but they handle all of your customer service for you, saving you that 10 hours per week. You use that 10 hours per week to do something more valuable for your business and to make your business more money. Again, possible to double, triple that initial investment in just a matter of a few months. Once you're a little farther along the road, another great investment can be getting better equipment for your team. Now let's say that you have that person but they're working on a beaten up old laptop that crashes all the time. Same principle applies. If you're paying them the same but you can increase their productivity even a little bit, you're gonna make a lot more profit. So that is your next investing priority. Invest in improving your own productivity if you have a job that you like right now or if you're trying to start a business, put 90% of your money into your own business until you cannot productively invest any more money. Now, for most people watching this video, that's gonna be the stage that you're in for the next couple years. Most of the time, if you're investing less than $10,000 a month into your own business, you can probably invest more productively and you could probably make at least double your money back within the first year, or at least more than you can make in the stock market. Now, it is possible to invest too much money in your own business, but that point is gonna come for most of you guys later down the road. You're gonna eventually reach a point in your business where you might put more money in and you get less money out than you put in. I have personally made this mistake in the past, but to kind of give you an idea of where that point comes, some of my mistakes that I made of investing too much in my business were renting an enormous office to house 100 employees, having a $2 million a month payroll, uh, paying Salesforce half a million dollars every year for software. That is a type of thing where eventually it became too much and I would have been better off to put that money in the stock market. Now, if you're not close to that point, I don't want you to worry about this for a while, but the rest of this video is just gonna be your long-term plan for when you do eventually get to that point. Let's say you're fortunate enough to have no debt and you've already invested all the money that you can into your own business. When you're at that point, your next investing priority will be to put 100% of your investable funds into a retirement account. Now, this is the last time I'm gonna say the word retirement account because that word I know discourages many people from using these types of accounts. If you don't know what I'm talking about by retirement accounts, what I mean by that is 401Ks, IRAs, SEP IRAs, uh, Roth IRAs, Roth 401ks, or basically any type of tax deferred account. If you're in your 30s, or especially if you're in your 20s, I know what you're thinking. Like, oh, retirement, that seems so far away. I might be dead by then. That's so far in the future. It's boring. It's not fun to think about. It's not sexy. I get it. And that's why we're banning the word retirement accounts from this discussion from here on out. What I want you to think about these accounts as is tax deferred accounts or basically very low tax accounts. And here's the reason why I want you to think of things that way. Number one, the power of deferring taxes is enormous. I'm gonna show on the screen right now some calculations for how much you would get over 30 years if you invested your money at a 10% return, contributed the same amount each month, versus if you invested that money in a tax deferred account. You can see the power of tax deferral makes a very big difference. This is a really big deal, even though saving 20% or 30% on your taxes immediately doesn't seem like a huge deal right now. It's much more than that when you account for the effects of compounding. But I know what you're thinking. Man, I don't know if I can wait till I'm 65 to withdraw this money, like I might need this money in five or 10 years. But here's the good news. If you do need this money in five or 10 years, and some of you may, you can actually get this money out. And that's why these accounts should not be called retirement accounts. They should just be referred to as tax deferred accounts. Now, there's a few different ways that you can get this money out if you need it before you're 65. First of all, if you have a 401k, you can get a 401k loan at a very low interest rate. A lot of people don't realize this, but you can effectively take your money out penalty free before you retire at any time if you really do need it. You could also start a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k. 
in that case, if you really needed the money, you could withdraw the money, you'll have to pay the regular taxes, but no penalty if you do need this money early. Here's another reason why you should prioritize these tax deferred accounts. Now, I know retirement seems a long ways away. I know a lot of you might be thinking like, oh, I'll just get to 65 and I'm just gonna die like five years after that and this will just fund my nursing home bills. But I really believe strongly for reasons that I've studied extensively, it probably will not be like that for people my age and younger. The reason for that is, every year medical technology is improving and you can see the 70 year olds of today are nothing like the 70 year olds of 50 years ago. I mean, just look at the current presidential race. We have Joe Biden, who is 78, running against Donald Trump, who I believe is 74. Two guys in their 70s, but both of them are much more active than people were in their 70s back in, you know, 50 years ago. So think about what another 50 years is gonna be like. People in their 70s, 50 years from now, are gonna be living a great lifestyle, I think. And I think we're underestimating how much longer we're gonna live and how much quality of life we're gonna have in retirement. I know it's a long ways away, but I do believe that you might reasonably expect to live until you're 100, 150, 200, or even beyond that. And you might be living a really great lifestyle, not like today's 80 year olds, but like today's 30 year olds when you're in your 80s. So think about that too. That's the last reason why you gotta prioritize these tax deferred accounts. So now you know, tax deferred is the way to go. So what type of tax deferred account do you choose? What I would recommend for most people is a conventional tax deferred account. What I mean by that is a regular 401k or a regular IRA, depending on if you have a job or if you're self-employed, where you don't pay taxes now and where you pay your taxes later on down the road in retirement. The reason for that is you will probably leave the bulk of this money in until retirement. You can get a 401k loan if you do need this money early. And when you're in retirement, chances are your income will be lower because you're not saving. You're just withdrawing from your accounts. So probably your tax bracket will be lower. Let's say though you're watching this video, you don't wanna save until retirement, you think there's a good chance you need this money early. In that case, do a Roth 401k or a Roth IRA. If you have a job, you should always choose the 401k option. If you don't have 401k open to you, then you should choose the IRA option. When you go Roth, you pay the taxes now. But the good part about this is you can withdraw that money anytime you want without penalty. So if you have that fear of locking the money up, go Roth and don't even worry about it. So you got the basics down, you know to go tax deferred, and you chose what type of tax deferred account that you're gonna create. So how do you create this account and what do you invest in within this account? I'm gonna show you. When you're first starting off, I know for a lot of people, especially people that don't enjoy investing, that don't nerd out on this stuff like I do, it seems complicated, it seems difficult, and it seems like a chore. So that's why the first thing that I want you to invest with is a robo-advisor. And it's not as complicated, not as technical as it seems, super easy. I'm gonna explain what a robo-advisor is right now. A robo-advisor is a service like Wealthfront or Betterment. What this basically is, is software that invests your money for you. Now, it's not really like it sounds. It's not really a robot investing your money. Basically, it's a team of the best economists, the best investment bankers, and the best financial advisors in the world. These guys are far beyond what your local financial advisor could do for you, and they're much cheaper. What these guys have done is they have made the perfect portfolio for every level of risk. Or if it's not perfect, it's pretty close. Probably much better than you can do on your own knowing nothing at all about investing. If you know nothing about investing, you have your first thousand dollars, you put that first hundred into a robo-advisor. The robo-advisor that I personally use is Betterment. I like Betterment better than Wealthfront, the other major option, because I like their interface better. Both services are virtually identical though in terms of what they do. And it's really just a matter of preference of which company you like dealing with. In the description below, I have links to sign up for Wealthfront and for Betterment, and these are affiliate links, so if you do sign up, I'll make a few bucks in commission, and I would appreciate it if you use my link. So check those services out. That is the simplest, easiest way to get started investing. Now, I know what you're thinking. If you're new to investing, you want a real life in-person expert, you want a mahogany paneled office you can sit with, and some authoritative guide that can give you advice, hold you by the hand, and show you exactly what you want to invest in. But I'm gonna to explain to you why that is not what you want and why that concept is obsolete. Number one, 
the fees on Betterment and Wealthfront and any other robo-advisor are much, much lower than what a real-life financial advisor will charge. A real-life financial advisor will typically charge 1-2% to in fees, and they will typically recommend funds which charge additional fees on top of that, and there's some fees that aren't even disclosed. Altogether, you're probably paying 3-4% to of your investments every year in fees with a traditional financial advisor. Now I know what you're thinking, 3 to 4%, what's the big deal? Don't be so cheap. It makes a huge difference in the long term because it's 3 to 4% of your total assets, but that's not really the right way to think about it. Now, let's say you're investing with the average financial advisor and you're making a 7% return. You're paying 3.5% per year in total fees. 3.5% is not the right way to think about it. The right way to think about it is that you are giving that advisor half of your total return. 50% is the right way to think about it. So that's why you can't be paying fees like this. You need to go robo-advisor because you're gonna be paying much, much less in fees. Now, I know your other objection. I know you're probably thinking like, okay, maybe I'm paying more, but that must buy me higher quality. After all, with most services, if you pay more, then you get something better. Unfortunately, it doesn't really work like that in the stock market. And actually, fortunately for us investors. When you invest in the stock market, there are only so many different portfolios that you can choose. When you invest with a robo-advisor like Betterment or Wealthfront, you're not just getting one local financial advisor to make your portfolio. Like I said before, you're getting a team of the very best experts in the world. So you're not only paying less, you're getting more. You're getting a better portfolio for less money. And that's why I feel robo-advisors are the best solution for beginner investors. Now, what do you invest in exactly? What I would recommend is that you go through the questionnaire that Betterment or Wealthfront gives you. They have very comprehensive questionnaires to assess your risk tolerance. And what I would say is that you should just take their recommendation that comes out of that questionnaire. It's very good and it's a great, great starting point. The advantage of this is that you will have a professionally designed portfolio for low fees and it's going to be pretty good for your level of risk tolerance. You're also going to have software where if there is a market drop, it can give you advice about what to do. For example, I have almost all of my net worth in stocks and bonds. There was recently a huge market drop. I'm filming this in August 2020. Right after the huge market drop of March 2020, which happened because of the disease which starts with C, ends with 19. I won't say it because YouTube might demonetize me, but you know what I'm talking about. So I lost about a third of my wealth overnight. Betterment though, they send me emails daily talking about how for past market drops, those who sold too early ultimately made much less money. Those who stayed the course ultimately made much more money. I'm filming this in August 2020. As of this time, the market is now at a new all-time high, and I'm very grateful that I took Betterment's advice. So you're gonna get advice like that to guide you through turbulent times and to help you stay the course with your investing, even though there isn't a real life person for you to talk with. All right, so that's level one, robo-advisor. If you're not really interested in investing and you just wanna do the minimum to get a decent return, you could just do that. Take Betterment's recommendations, put money into Betterment each month, and you're gonna do all right. But I know some of you guys wanna do beyond all right. So I'm gonna show you the next level to go to once you're comfortable with putting your money into Betterment or Wealthfront each month. It's to invest directly with Vanguard. Now, Vanguard is the company that these robo-advisors have the majority of their underlying mutual funds or their underlying investments with. Essentially, it's what you're paying them to buy for you. You can buy these funds directly, and then you can save yourself even that small robo-advisor fee. Another advantage of buying your investments directly is that you have a little bit more control. As I said before, the portfolios and Betterment and Wealthfront are designed by experts. But in my opinion, they can be improved upon and tweaked for everybody's individual situations. That may sound a little arrogant that you can improve on the performance of a team of experts, but I'm gonna show you exactly how in a minute. Now, just to tell you a little bit about Vanguard and why I feel you should invest all your money with Vanguard, outside of your own business, of course. Vanguard is a company which mainly specializes in what is called index funds. For those of you guys who don't know, an index fund isn't like most mutual funds where there's some expert in charge that chooses stocks or bonds or some kind of securities to invest in. With Vanguard, what they will do is they will buy every stock 
or every bond or whatever type of fund it is in equal weight for the overall market capitalization. What that means is let's say that Apple makes up 5% of the overall US stock market. 5% of Vanguard's total stock market index, the main fund I recommend you buy, will be in Apple. Essentially, to summarize how it works, Vanguard does not try to pick winners. They just buy everything in the market equally, according to its market capitalization. Now, I've read a bunch of books on this. You can dive deep into this too and read the works of Jack Bogle. To summarize this, there is a large body of academic research showing that it is nearly impossible for most people to beat the market in the long run. And in the long run, if you just buy these index funds, you're nearly guaranteed to do better. You can take my word for it if you want to do it the easy way, or read some Jack Bogle books, read some academic research, and you're going to see that this is the case. Let's talk about how you can use that flexibility to your advantage and how you can improve on the performance of a robo-advisor if you're advanced and you want to dive a little deeper into this. Number one, robo-advisors are biased to be more conservative. In my opinion, you should be buying more stock than the robo-advisor recommends. The reason for this is that robo-advisors are designed with the average person in mind, most of these people being beginners. If you're more advanced, you're more likely to be able to ride out a market downturn. If you've read books about investing, you know why you need to stay the course. So I feel you should own more stocks. I personally own about 90% stocks in my portfolio and about 10% bonds, which is much higher than what Betterment recommends for me. I feel that's a good investment in the long term, and I recommend you get to about that level of stocks too. The second reason why you should invest with Vanguard directly and how you can beat the performance of these robo-advisors is by focusing more on the US. Betterment and Wealthfront both recommend right now that 30 to 40% of your investments be outside the United States. Up until recently, these services recommended that 50% of your investments be outside the United States. The logic behind this is as follows. Most people are dependent on the US economy. If the US economy goes south, you might lose the, your job. So at that moment, it would be opportune to have investments in other countries that are kind of booming your portfolio just when you need it the most. Now, the school of thought behind this is that most people are dependent on the US economy because they work in the US economy. Therefore, if the US economy goes down, it would be good to have a lot of investments in other countries that are going up at that moment. There's something to be said for that school of thought, but in my opinion, that school of thought is obsolete. Again, you can dive deep into this, read the academic research, read Jack Bogle's books, but to summarize it, here's why I'm invested almost entirely in the US. Number one, the US provides higher returns than other countries. Uh, we might not be a perfect country, but compared to some of the countries out there, we are more business friendly. So because of that, the US has historically provided higher returns. Number two, the US contains most of the mega cap companies in the world, or most of the really large companies in the world. When a lot of the early research on stocks and bonds were being done, US companies were much less globally diversified. So let's say if you're investing in Apple, you're not really investing in a US company, you're investing in a global company. Same thing if you invest in General Motors or Goldman Sachs or any other big US company which you'll be buying through these mutual funds. So that's another way you can improve on the performance of Betterment or Wealthfront. Now, here's the third and most exciting reason why I feel that some people, business oriented people like us, should manage their investments directly which is that you can invest in alternative investments, which may be a better investment than any stock, any bond, any mutual fund in the long term. And here's what I mean by that. One example of an alternative investment, which would never be included in any robo-advisor portfolio, is Peer Street. I'm including a link to Peer Street's website down below if you want to check it out for yourself. To summarize how Peer Street works, it's loans that are backed by real estate. You can make between seven and 10% per year on these loans, and because they're backed by real estate, they hardly ever lose investor capital, and these loans are almost risk-free. They're not quite risk-free. There is still the chance of some disaster happening and you losing all of your investment, but they're very close to that. To give you an example of why I invest in Peer Street, if you were to invest in the US total bond market index, the main bond mutual fund that provides fixed income to most people, you would be making about a 3% return, maybe 4% at the most. When you invest in Peer Street, you can expect a total return after all your defaults of about 8%. So that's 5% per year. Again, I know these percentages don't sound like much, but think about it in terms of doubling or more your total return. 
That's why I feel like these alternative investments are worth a look. Even if you're not comfortable putting all your money in these alternative investments right now, again, I do feel like you need to learn about it. What if Pier Street blows up? What if Pier Street continues to outperform the bond market for five or 10 or 20 years and you never learn anything about it? You will have trailed Pier Street investors for all this time and you'll be playing catch up. You're gonna have to spend a few years investing on a small scale to become comfortable and you won't be confident enough to pull the trigger on a large scale when it really counts. So even if you don't wanna put a ton of money into it, put a little bit of money into Pier Street and start seeing how it works. Here's the second alternative investment that I'm invested in that I think you should be invested in as well. Fundrise. Again, I'm gonna link the Fundrise in the description down below. And you can see the website on screen right now. The way that Fundrise works is that, like Pier Street, it's backed by real estate. But it's different than Pier Street in a few important ways. Now, part of Fundrise's portfolios are backed by real estate debt. But a lot of the portfolio is backed by real estate equity. What that means is that you're not loaning money to someone to buy a property, you are directly buying the property yourself. Or you're not owning it yourself, but the fund owns the property and you own the property through the fund. Because you're doing this through Fundrise, you're not putting all your money into one property. You might own a hundred different properties. The other advantage is that you can get into things like shopping centers and large apartment buildings, which traditionally have higher returns. And you can get started with just $5,000 or sometimes even less, depending on exactly what kind of portfolio you're buying. So that's another great alternative investment that I think may outperform the stock market and the bond market in the long term. Again, you don't have to put all your money into this right now, especially if you're new to investing. Just put a few hundred or a few thousand dollars in, dip your toes into the water, and start learning about this potentially exciting new investment. All right, so let's say you love investing. You are willing to devote a lot of time to this and you want really, really superior returns. The next level beyond this will be buying individual stocks. Now, for the vast majority of you guys watching this, I would not recommend doing this. Unless you devote yourself to this full time or nearly full time, chances are you're gonna put a lot of work into this and you're gonna underperform the market. You're gonna make less money than you would have just investing through Vanguard. So if you just wanna invest through Vanguard, you just wanna do those alternative investments, that's perfectly fine for most people. In fact, that is what I have mostly done myself. I only have a small amount of money in individual stocks because I'm dipping my toes in the water. I'm learning about this because one day I wanna do more with it. So the process of buying individual stocks is much more complicated and I would encourage you to spend a lot of time educating yourself about this topic before buying individual stocks. I would also recommend that you spend a few years investing on a small scale and seeing if you really do beat your Vanguard mutual funds. If you don't, maybe you just need to spend a little more time investing on a small scale before you scale things up. But if you do, you can devote more and more of your portfolio to this over time. So I'm certainly not an expert on buying individual stocks, but I can kind of fill you in on the basics and what I'm doing so far. When you're looking for individual stocks, what I would recommend doing is looking for something with a low price to earnings ratio. What that means is that you're paying less for every dollar of profit the company makes. Let's say if a company makes a million dollars a year in profit and the total market capitalization or the total value of all stock outstanding is $10 million. The price to earning ratio in that case would be 10. So that's one simple metric you can use to gauge if a company is gonna be a good investment. The next measure that you can look at is the ratio of assets to market capitalization. Now what that means is how much money they have in the bank, how much plant and equipment they have. Basically, if the company went out of business, how much they could sell their assets for in the worst case scenario. Now this is important because it gives you a level of safety. Let's say that a company had a total market capitalization of a billion dollars and they have a billion dollars in assets like cash and short-term securities, which they could easily liquidate. In that case, that company is low risk. The reason for that is they have a lot of assets which they could sell in the worst case scenario. Even if the company went out of business, you likely wouldn't lose very much of your money. So that's another metric that you can look at. Those are just a few bare bones metrics you can look at, but there's also much, much more you wanna look at than that. You wanna look at the dividend and the dividend payout ratio. In other words, that means how much money they pay you to own the stock each year and what percentage of their profits they're paying out. 
It's also not completely quantitative. You want to invest in companies that have a good future ahead of them relative to their current price. That's going to involve assessing their marketing, assessing their industry, and the nature of their products. Again, we're going real, real deep in the weeds here. You're going to have to spend some time. But if you're interested in it, it could be really fun. Most of you guys will never need to do this, but for those few of you guys who do, start doing it on a small scale, and when you're getting good results, scale up. All right, so for those of you guys who love investing, who want to devote your life to investing, here's the next level that you're ultimately going to go to, trading derivatives. Now, I have never done this. I've never traded a single option or derivative, but if you can do this, you can make significantly higher returns if you're good at it than investing in stocks. For those of you guys who don't know, what I mean by derivatives or options is selling the right to sell your stock to someone at a certain price or to buy stock from someone at a certain price. Um, these are often referred to as put options or call options. And an easy way to think about it is with a call option, you have the right to call the stock to you or to buy the stock at a certain price in the future. With a put option, you have the option to put your stock on someone else or to sell the stock at a certain price in the future, regardless of what the actual market price at that time is. Incredibly complicated, incredibly, incredibly difficult to make a profit at, but for those who master it, it can be very, very lucrative. I've never done this. I don't think I ever will do this, but this is kind of the ultimate nerd level of investing that you could go to if you want to. 99.9% .9 of you watching this video right now should never trade options, but I'm just saying that for those few of you who do, that is the ultimate level of investing. So just to recap everything, you implement the 90-10 plan for this first thousand dollars. 90% of this money goes into paying off your debt. 10% goes into a robo-advisor, something like Betterment or Wealthfront, and you simply follow their recommendations as far as what to buy. Once you've eliminated your high interest debt, you put 90% of your investable money into your own business. You buy a better computer. You buy better marketing for your business. You buy more advertising. You hire people. You spend as much as you can productively on your own business for 90% of your money. 10% continues going into Betterment or Wealthfront. After that, you start putting 100% of your money into your 401k, your IRA, or your other tax deferred account. If you're paranoid about needing this money before retirement, just go Roth and then you can access that money anytime you want. Once you've maxed out these tax deferred accounts, then you will invest in taxable accounts. And like we talked about before, you can just invest with Betterment or Wealthfront in either account and you'll do just fine. You want to take it a little higher level? Go with Vanguard. And I showed you a few ways you can improve on the performance of the robo-advisor. If you want to take it to the next level, alternative investments like Peer Street, like Fundrise, may take your returns even higher. For those of you ninjas out there, those of you nerds like me, you could research how to invest in individual stocks. Again, 99% of you guys should not be doing this. Only those of you guys who are willing to devote months to your education on buying individual stocks should do this. And for those of you ultra nerds who are even beyond me, you could trade derivatives to make really high returns in much shorter periods of time if you're willing to really dedicate your life to this. So that's how to invest your first thousand dollars and how to move beyond that and keep your investments going when you have more money. So if you like this video, I'd really love it if you left me a comment, if you shared this video with your friends. If you want to learn how to generate some money to invest so that way you can start buying all these investments I'm talking about, I recommend you pick up a copy of my book, The 15 Steps to Profitable YouTube Marketing. In my book, I tell you the story about how I started the business when I was completely broke and started generating money to pay off my debts. And I show you how I ultimately went on to generate all the money that's funding my investments right now. In my book, I show you why YouTube marketing is the best opportunity to make money online right now. And I show you everything you need to know to make money with YouTube marketing. I show you how to write great ad scripts, how to produce great video ads, how to manage ad campaigns within Google Ads, how to build a website that converts YouTube ad visitors into buyers. Everything you need to know, start to finish, you can learn in this book. And the best part is, you can get a copy for free. It's $19.95 on Amazon, but if you could click claim book below, I'll ship you out a copy for free. All you gotta do is cover the shipping. So click claim book below, get your copy, and I'll see you next time.